SIGGRAPH 92 just broke records this morning. We had over 31,000 attendees. This is the Olympics in our area. From the atom to the universe, it's all here. Chicago, Illinois. The International Computer Graphics Community gathers at the McCormick Place Convention Center for SIGGRAPH, their annual conference on the state of the art in tools, techniques, and applications. Here on the exhibition floor, conference goers navigate through an almost overwhelming array of exhibits. But one exhibit stands apart at this year's conference, Showcase, created by the pioneers in high performance computing and communications, or HPCC, Showcase provides a unique glimpse at science as it will likely be done in the 21st century. Represented in force at Showcase, the National Science Foundation Supercomputer Centers. We have an opportunity in an in a organized fashion for a week's show to bring something like Showcase in which three dozen scientific projects from all over the country can now come through the network and appear to be in McCormick Place, even though the scientific instruments are in Minnesota, California, North Carolina, you walk into Showcase, hey, it's all here. And that's the magic of the network. Thanks to high-speed fiber optic links connecting McCormick Place to national computer networks, the Showcase exhibits enable the audience to peer into phenomena across almost every scale. Like journeying across an atomic surface imaged in real time by a scanning, tunneling microscope, navigating through the motions of giant molecules, visualizing sound waves breaking up a kidney stone, or simulating a thunderstorm that could spawn a deadly tornado. Then from a vantage point high in space, peering down at the giant waves propagating from an earthquake beneath the Pacific Ocean, or traveling far beyond our planet to the beginnings of the cosmos itself. The response to all of the exhibits has been very positive and very enthusiastic and very interested. I think people like hearing about the, the high-end research. Simulated on remote supercomputers or created from data gathered by faraway instruments, these visualizations demonstrate the power of distributed computing, doing computation where the resources are and not necessarily on a single machine. In a few years, the network is the computer and it doesn't matter where your supercomputer is, it doesn't matter where your data resources are, where, where your sensors, your scanners, or your satellite data. It can come from anywhere, it can be stored anywhere, but you can access it at your fingertips on your desktop. What we're going to do right now is to actually use the Cray YMP at NCSA down in the middle of Illinois. For example, researchers linked to a supercomputer at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications demonstrate how distributed computing techniques can be utilized to evolve a thunderstorm model and change the parameters in real time. The high-powered capabilities that you'll have on your desktop will not be sufficient to carry out the model simulations or to collect the data or to store the data. So it is really necessary to get out there to where the data is or where the computations are being done so that you can get the appropriate information back to your desktop. Computation is not only essential for simulating reality, but also for measuring it and processing and visualizing the vast amounts of resulting data. By obtaining the output of instruments in real time, scientists will increasingly be able to control, even steer instruments from anywhere in the country and eventually the world. The structure that we'll be looking at today is the Golgi apparatus. One it's example, a team from the San Diego Supercomputer Center and nearby research institutions created a prototype distributed computing environment to control an electron microscope in San Diego, where nearby supercomputer processes the resulting image data. Hello, Chicago. Chicago, are you there? It looks good here. Uh, can I go ahead and transfer? From a workstation in Chicago, a scientist yeah. interacts over the network with a technician in San Diego, requesting that the sample be rotated or a yet tinier portion be probed in real time. Yes, we've got the image here. Looks very good. Then a 3D representation can be called up and animated. In particular, we're looking at a structure within these nerve cells that is stained called the Golgi apparatus. We're interested in its structure and function because we've discovered that in Alzheimer's disease there's an alteration in the distribution of this structure. From the structures within a single nerve cell to the anatomy of the brain, distributed computing permits complex medical images to be explored remotely. 
Here, magnetic resonance images of the brain computed at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center are displayed and manipulated locally on a low-cost workstation. Linking together both instruments and researchers creates opportunities for scientific collaboration on a scale as never before. Without doubt, the need for such collaboration is growing in proportion to the complexity of the problems to be studied. The model of a human being, a scientist, sitting at a computer alone has to go away. We have to have collaborative efforts involving many scientists working with, with collections of computers. And we have to develop the technologies and the techniques and, and the sociology to go along with, with group activities. One such tool to aid collaboration is NCSA's Collage, a software package that allows the sharing of text, data and images. Here, near the showcase floor, exhibitors demonstrate a local example of a collaborative session. Already though, the software is being tested across national computer networks. But with growing torrents of data from supercomputers and instruments, how can scientists make sense of it all? Human beings can absorb about a gigabit per second of visual data. The computers are now generating about at peak with big com expensive computers about a gigabit per second of visual data. It's quite clear that in the years to come, and not very many years, we're going to exceed that limit. New kinds of human and computer interfaces, such as virtual reality, are necessary to turn all the data into shared knowledge. For an exhibit that really caught the crowd's imagination, little could rival the cave. Here spectators could share the experience of total immersion in a virtual environment, complete with sound and 3D images. Virtual reality is a mode of scientific visualization. It's something that lets you get inside of the data. Now, most computer screens, you're outside looking in. In this, you're inside looking out. In the cave, you can really have an expert navigator, like a guide in the jungle, and somebody who's the research scientist who knows what to look for in the data. They don't have to be the same person. We don't live with a screen in front of our eyes. We live in a three-dimensional world. We walk around in it. We participate in it. That's why we're human. That's how our, much of our development of our brain comes, right? interacting in that world. And, and if we want artificial reality to be anything as compelling as, as, as physical reality, then we must move into these virtual worlds. But beyond the excitement of virtual reality are its serious scientific applications. Designing molecules, predicting the weather, mapping the galaxies in the cosmos. These are but some of the grand challenges of science and society. Well, what you're seeing now is that the government has, has realized that the grand challenges of computational science and engineering, those problems that are of, of great importance, either to say basic research, industrial competitiveness, or society as a whole, that those can become drivers for our whole country.